The feast was just a great setting, and of course we, all times of the year, consider you know, the kingdom of God and uh, long for the return of Jesus Christ and the establishment of it. And uh, we know that this weary, suffering, troubled world uh, needs the return of Jesus Christ. And we can at times, at a glance, look around and, and think, well, maybe things aren't all that bad, you know, and uh, maybe there are certain folks that, you know, that it's really not bad for them. They have a great life. At least it looks that way to us. And, uh, you know, those bright spots, uh, it's nice to have those. It's nice to have uh, joyful, rejoicing times such as a feast, such as uh, we oftentimes have here in our community. Uh, you know, we have a, a great community here. But uh, I remember one time visiting a Church of God congregation in a certain city, and uh, the pastor mentioned that the evening before, him and his wife decided just to drive around in a very affluent neighborhood of this city. The, and uh, he said they were driving along and looking at these uh, estates and houses, and, and I remember him saying to his, he told us, he told his wife, you know, those people don't need the kingdom of God. And I uh, immediately disagreed because even though I believe this, the timing of this was over 20 years ago. It was before the, the uh, 1995 church quake. And uh, so this minister, I don't know what their mindset was to, to say that. And I guess at times we can say that, hey, hey, they have it made, you know. But, you know, when we look at perhaps a fantastic estate, some uh, immaculate landscaping and uh, exquisite architecture, perhaps a beautiful chandelier through a high window or something, we, that is a, a very uh, pleasing portrait and picture for us to look at on the surface. But, you know, behind those walls, we really don't know what kind of home that is. It could be a very uh, wonderful home or it could be a terrible home. You know, the atmosphere could be one of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Or it could be one of constant negative tension, turmoil, even abuse, or sometimes even evil. Hopefully, most, most of the homes in our land are, are not that way, but we know sometimes they are. And, but if we look at even the house, the home, that has the fruits of the spirit within, they're still subject, that property and that family is still subject to the elements of the world. We have the disasters and the diseases and uh, they do not discriminate. Uh, these estates are also subject to thieves and robbers, even murderers, and the evils of this world. So I disagree when someone says that person or this person doesn't appear to need the kingdom of God. But of course, there are many other evident examples of the need for God's kingdom for every human being. And we don't have to look very far. I know my wife, the last few years, has taken on a new line of work. And uh, I don't ever know any of the clients. I don't. Uh, uh, know any of the timing or, or where these people live, but there are certain cultures that we just pray that they could find solutions the same place we find solutions in God's word and, and with support from each other. She one time mentioned this lady was expressing that she was physically, sexually abused as a child and that by the time she was eight years old, she was very becoming very anxious and uh, traumatized by it. The only solution her mother knew for her anxiety was to get out the needle and shoot her up with heroin at eight years old. And then, as this lady continued to tell her story to my wife, she mentioned she went ahead, she grew up and she had children, but one day she came home, found her 14-year-old daughter face down, deceased, with the needle in her arm. So there are cultures that, oh, they desperately need the kingdom of God and the return of Jesus Christ. But they also need something now 
They need that cycle broken, those cultures. Uh, cultures. And, you know, what a blessing we have to have a glimpse of the kingdom of God. We have faith in God and faith in Jesus Christ, knowing that God will fulfill his promise. We have his word, we have his promise, and we believe God. But what about those who don't know Jesus Christ, who do not have any kind of relationship with him? And they, many of them, have no hope or no knowledge of his kingdom. How do they receive a glimpse of hope, a glimpse of salvation, a glimpse of Jesus Christ, or a glimpse of his kingdom? Well, brethren, that's where we come in. It's mentioned that God could have raised up stones, but he didn't. He raised up you, and he raised up me. And I've titled the sermon after a verse, uh, familiar chapter, familiar verse, uh, the prophetic chapter in Matthew 24, Jesus Christ's words. Uh, the title is Matthew 24, 22. I'll read verse 21 first. For then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world. To this time no, no nor ever shall be. And uh, most of us are very familiar with that and with that prophecy. And I think, you know, we're very blessed where, where we live in this land of the United States. If we were to be transplanted into another part of the world, we would probably think this verse was already being fulfilled the way life is for many, many people. But verse 22, and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. And we usually say alive because we know the plan of salvation God has. Should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. The elect, you and I, brethren, the elect have a pretty important role when it comes to the continuation of the human race. The elect are the only glimpse many will have of Jesus Christ. And the glimpse of perhaps a way to break the cycle of certain cultures. So, what does the elect look like? And what does the world look for? Well, that brings up another question. If we're to be Christ-like, what did Jesus look like to those he interacted with when he walked upon the earth? Now, there are artist renditions of perhaps Jesus' of physical appearance. I don't know if there's any proof of that. And then the scripture indicates he looked pretty ordinary. And we read that he wasn't from a particularly wealthy family. Kind of ordinary, not from a wealthy family. Sounds kind of familiar to me. Sounds like a lot of us. But if we look at the scripture, we'll see that it does tell us what he looked like. And we can actually see what he looks like. And that will be by defining God. So I'll turn to 1 John, the fourth chapter, a couple of verses, verse 8 first. And when the people saw Jesus, I believe they saw this. John, 1 John 4, verse 8, He that loves not knows not God, for God is love. And you notice how quickly I'm not talking about his physical appearance. In verse 16, John, 1 John 4, verse 16, and we have known and believed that the love that God has to us, God is love, and he that dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. That last part of the verse is a description of the elect or a definition. God is love and he that dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. So if Jesus looked like love and we are to emulate and become like him, then what does love look like? Well, fortunately, 
from the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, we get a very good description of what love looks like. And I'll turn to 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, and we'll kind of look at these a couple of different ways, uh, primarily verses 4 through 6. Uh, but before we look at them in regard to us, let's just think about them. You know that Jesus, Emmanuel, God in the flesh, was seen by men. So what did they see? And what did he do? Who did he see? Who did he go to in his ministry? Well, he certainly had to deal with the religious system of the day, the one that eventually killed him. And yes, he had some words and some actions for them. The scribes and the Pharisees had the same law that Jesus perfectly obeyed. And yes, they focused on obeying the letter of that law right down to the, to the finest thing. And then they would add to the law and then they would methodically enforce it upon the Jews of the time and anyone that they could have control over. And they did that to the point that it pretty much negated the intent and the spirit of the law, which is to love our God with all our heart, mind, and soul, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Now, did the religious systems of the day look like love? Do the religious systems of our time look like love and throughout history have they looked like love how do they stack up to 1 Corinthians 13 verse 4 it starts out love is patient were the scribes and Pharisees patient when Christ was when they encountered Christ well next it says love is kind they weren't very kind to Jesus. It envies not. Love envies not. They were very envious of this teacher, this rabbi who showed up and seemingly had every answer better than they did. Vaunts not itself. They were power hungry. Not puffed up. They wanted to exalt themselves. We have the parable of the Pharisee and the publican. Did not, love does not behave itself unseemly. Did that religious system follow that? Or did they conspire to trick Jesus so that they could uh, accuse him and arrest him? Seeks not her own. They were definitely concerned about their territory and their authority is not easily provoked. It only took a few words of Jesus sometimes and then the religious leaders were provoked very easily. And think no evil. Oh, they, they were planning things for Jesus and eventually they carried them out. And rejoices not in iniquity. Did that religious system rejoice not in iniquity? when Pilate, who knew Jesus was innocent, finally relented and said, and released Barabbas to them instead of Christ, they yelled, crucify him, crucify him, rejoicing in the sentencing of this innocent man. But love rejoices in the truth. The religious system of the time did not rejoice with the truth standing right there with them walking, talking, and living love. And Jesus lived these. So we always, when we consider this chapter, many have said, instead of love, put your name in there. And I think uh, David's expressed this this can, can be a little intimidating if we try to see how we stack up against the definition of love. That doesn't mean give up. You know, look at the first one. It basically, it says love is patient. 
And, you know, if I said Stanley West is patient, well, if we were one of the congregations where there were a lot of hallelujahs and amens from the congregation, my wife would be saying, strike one. And then while I'm trying to be patient, look at this second one. While I'm striving to do that, I have to be kind. So I, I try not to let these beautiful characteristics and attributes that are so difficult to live up to, although we, as we'll mention, we do have some help to help us grow in those. Try not to let it become like the Sunday chore list at the house, you know, on our homestead, because there's always innumerable, innumerable things to fix. And I think I mentioned a year or so ago of, about the differences between men and women on a speaking at, on about my wife and I's anniversary and that that, that book, uh, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, that those planets are way too close together because we think so differently. Because if I have this one track mind, I'll have these three chores I'm going to do tomorrow. I'll get one pretty well done, maybe start on another, and she'll compliment me. But then she'll say, you know what else, honey? We need to, and there's a colon there with a list after it, and it becomes overwhelming. So we can't let these, this definition of love become like that and we give up because, you know, human nature makes you want to just sit down, open a beer, and watch the football game because I know I can finish the football game. I might not be able to finish those chores, but that my wife, however, can see the whole picture, have numerous things going on, and accomplish so much. And I thank God all the time for that because uh, uh, she reared our four children, and uh, it it really took that kind of management, life management, uh, for that to have been accomplished. So. Uh, I love her deeply and, and thank God that she doesn't think like me, that we are different. So, but so we, I don't have to be intimidated by this. So I hearken back to that last part of John 4, 16, that God is love and he that dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. So God is there to help us grow in these attributes. We can't live up to these words on our own, but if we call on God, rely on his spirit, we can definitely improve our lives and those around us. You know, there was a time when we, there are times in the Bible we'll see Christ when he's just with his disciples. It seems like a, uh, you know, really a good time for teaching. And this walking and talking example of love was, was an example to the disciples first, but then we have Jesus interacting with, or we might even in today's vernacular say, hanging out with uh, sinners and those who are socially unacceptable. And it kind of makes me ask the question, where did he have the most impact? Some of the things we read in Jesus' ministry is he had a big impact when he was interrelating with those that the society of the day would consider taboo. So he was among sinners and the socially unaccepted. He fed them, he taught them, he healed them, and he comforted them. And my wife has made a very good point in her job saying that we shouldn't just let our light shine among brethren and Christians. You know, it's like this room here. The, uh, I look out here and I see many lights. And I'm not talking about the fluorescence, especially the ones we haven't got burning yet. But there, there are many lights. There are many pillars here. And this room is bright with examples and with light. But she mentions where do you shine the brightest? And she believes it's when she goes into the darkness. Not to join them, but to give them a glimpse 
of light, give them a glimpse of hope. And I mentioned some of the, the cultures uh, she has to deal with. And when we do that, perhaps, brethren, the elect, those with God dwelling in us, we do give others a glimpse of the kingdom of God, a glimpse of the image of Jesus Christ. And we become a walking, talking example of love. So are we an image of that? Is our congregation an image of love? Are the religions of today an image of love? We think of our country. It's you know, proposes to set the moral standard, but is it an image of love? Was the Senate floor the last few weeks the image of love? I'd like to turn to Hebrews, the first chapter, and the word image is mentioned here uh, regarding how God works with us today and reveals things to us. It says, Hebrews 1, verse 1, God, who at sundry times and in different manners spoke in time past unto the fathers by the prophets... And we don't have that today. I know there are those who proclaim to be prophets. But he has in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, set down, at the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus Christ, the express image of the Father. God the Father and Jesus Christ are the image of love. I'd like now to turn to Malachi, the third chapter, and verse beginning in verse 1. It's a prophetic scripture one many of us have read for and heard for years and perhaps decades and it begins behold I will send my messenger and many of our of us are familiar with prophecy and how people sometimes want to assign the scriptures to a certain individual or uh, a certain group or a certain time but I try to read these prophecies just like it's talking to me. It says, Behold, I will send my messenger. If we're to be a walking, talking, living image of love, we're a messenger. We're a messenger to the world and those who are in darkness. And he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. And where is his temple? We are his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant, Jesus Christ, whom you delight in, behold, he shall come, says the Lord of hosts. But who may abide in the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi. There's purification going on, and we no longer have the Levitical priesthood. We are the priesthood. And purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. And then it will be pleasant to God, verse 4. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old, as in the former years. I'd like to read something that is written about these few verses. You know, sermons are much easier to give when you have a very supportive mother who brings you things like this to read. And this is uh, something she gave me concerning Malachi 3.3. It's titled, He Will Sit as a Refiner and Purifier of Silver. Some time ago, some ladies were reading scriptures in Malachi and came across Malachi 3.3. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. One lady decided to go to a silversmith and ask him about the process of refining silver. He explained the process and she asked, do you watch while it is being heated? He replied, yes, ma'am, I watch the furnace all the time. If the temperature and the time are not right, the silver will be ruined. 
The lady understood the beauty and comfort of that statement in connection with what is recorded in Malachi 3.3. God sees it as necessary to put his children into the furnace, but he is standing by intent on purifying his wisdom and love in them. He promises he will never let us be tested beyond what we can withstand. Before she left the silversmith, she asked one final question. How do you know when the process is finished? Oh, that's easy, the silversmith said. When I see my image in the silver, the refining process is complete. The lesson in Malachi 3.3 is God allows us to go through hard times so that we may grow and become strong. His goal is for us to become a reflection of him so that not only he can see himself in us, but also that others can see him through us. As I look out at the congregation, I perhaps uh, most of you are too young to remember a song from the 60s. That's supposed to be a joke, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I think even those younger have heard these words of this song, or at least this, this stanza of it. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. No, not just for some, but for everyone. And I can't disagree with that. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. No, not just for some, but for everyone. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved alive. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. What the world needs now is the return of Jesus Christ. But until God the Father decides to shorten those days, what the world needs today and tomorrow is love. What the world needs now is the elect. What the world needs now is hope. What the world needs now is a glimpse of the kingdom of God. What the world needs now is you. <laughs>